The way we have to look at agriculture as we move um, into the future is looking at it more as a holistic system. So you have the plants and you have the plants that surround it, you have bugs that visit the plants, and you also have the microbial communities that are associated with those plants. We're focusing on the microbiome portion of it and trying to harness the beneficial interactions within that system the best way we can. It's hard to imagine that these vineyards were nearly decimated by Pierce disease in the 90s. You know, there's been recent research where they're trying to understand and combat this disease. I can't wait to hear more about it. What is Pierce's disease? It is a uh, vascular disease of grapevines caused by a xylem limited bacterium called Xylella fastidiosa that resides within the water conducting tissue of the plant. What kind of symptoms do you get when, you, uh, when you've got the infection? So you can see these typical leaf scorch symptoms here. You also have green islands, which is irregular periderm development. The leaf blade has fallen off at the leaf petiole junction. The petiole remains attached and they can become very shriveled and that's why we call them matchstick petioles. And then if you were to look inside the plant, you would see a lot of vascular occlusion in the water conducting tissues. Hydraulic conductivity is very much compromised in these vines. So how does it spread? From plant to plant, it requires an insect vector. We have our classes of native sharpshooters, but we also have an invasive species, which is called the glassy wing sharpshooter. A preferred breeding and feeding host of the glassy wing sharpshooter is citrus. You can see here a vineyard that is next to a citrus grove under high sharpshooter pressure because they get to very high numbers in those citrus trees and then they fly into the vineyard to feed on the vines. What is the history of Pierce's disease? Pierce's disease is a recurrent problem here in the Temecula Valley. It wiped out the industry in the 1940s and recently in the 1990s with the appearance of the glassy wing shop shooter. As a wine grower, how does Pierce disease impact your business? One of the things we always struggle with is trying to find uh, the quality grapes that we need to make the best wine. We have all these employees that make their living making the wine, and if we can't supply it because we don't have the grapes, then we've lost all this huge economic impact that just spreads throughout the area. Can't say enough how important it is to stay vigilant and keep that uh, disease at bay. So it actually it has been valued at $100 million in California, but it's more about the risk that it can cause to the wine grape industry. So what's the procedure uh, if you do see an infection? You have to pull the vine out. And then once you do that, it's three or four years before you get another crop, plus all the expense of pulling them out and putting a new vine. So it can get quite costly. How we prepare the samples is we first surface sterilize the plant tissue, place it in liquid nitrogen, and we grind it to a fine powder. Then we transfer the powder to a Eppendorf microfuge tube, and the powder is what we use for downstream DNA extraction and microbial community analyses. What was your inspiration to study this? In vineyards that are under high Pierce's disease pressure, you can have a lot of sick vines um, surrounding a healthy vine. All vines in a vineyard are clonal, so they're all exactly the same. And so the hypothesis was that perhaps it's the microbial community that is conferring this tolerance to the disease. We had um, a handful of organisms that we wanted to work with and that we knew we could culture. And so then we passed those along to uh, Catherine Maloney. I'm a natural products chemist, and um, I was interested in trying to, to isolate small organic uh, molecules, chemicals that are produced by the fungus. And in order to do that, the first thing that we need is a way to test for this activity. So this is the um, what xylella looks like. It's kind of this speckled -y, um, appearance. This is xylella in the presence of cochleobolus, and here you can see that there's no xylella to be found on the plate. So the cochleobolus completely inhibited the growth of that xylella. 
And so we were really interested in that fungus in particular. So we're operating under the um, hypothesis that maybe there's a, a small molecule, a chemical that a fungus is producing that might be inhibiting Xylella. And in order to isolate that molecule, we need a way to test that inhibition. We used a method called column chromatography, um, which essentially uh, separated the compounds by polarity. We tested each of those 10 fractions, and somewhere in the middle tested positive for inhibiting Xylella. The major compound in that fraction was a known molecule. It's called radicinin. So we put different doses of radicinin on these filter discs, but when we up it to 50 micrograms, now we can see this small zone of inhibition where the xylella is not growing. 100 micrograms, it gets bigger. So this was pretty compelling data that showed that um, radicinin was responsible for the inhibition. So what are the next steps? Plants and bacteria and fungi are chemists, that they, they make a lot of really cool functional molecules, and if we can exploit that to cure things like Pierce's disease, that's awesome. One way could be preceding grapevines with the beneficial organisms that we've discovered, um, and another is treating vines that are already infected with xylella to see if we can cure them of the infection using natural product chemistry. I like the idea that plants, bacteria, and fungi are natural chemists. And you can use that same natural approach on other crops like citrus. Yes, in fact, that's where the agricultural research community is moving, um, towards understanding plants and all their associated organisms, like microbes, um, and how that network operates at a systems level to affect plant health and crop productivity.